This is the Losses Become Gains podcast, the podcast that talks about and normalizes the complexities of grief, life after loss, and all this entails. I'm your host, Tara Accardo. I'm a grief and transformational life coach, and I'm here to serve you guidance, tangible tools, and inspiration to help you cultivate a more meaningful, intentional, and beautiful life. A life where you'll discover gains from your losses and so much more. I'm so grateful you're here. Let's dive right in. Hello and welcome back to the Losses Become Gains podcast. I'm your host, Tara Accardo. And today I want to just have an open conversation about understanding and coping with our emotions as we grieve. And the reason I wanted to address this particular topic today is because I think there are a lot of misconceptions about how we feel and process our emotions. And we feel guilty for having certain emotions at certain times when so much of this is actually really beyond our control. That is a big learning that I have had, at least in my own grieving journey. But this is a massive key in coping with our grief properly and unlocking this full intentional life that I'm always going on about that we want to live. So with this episode, I didn't want it to be so much on the coping tools per se. Of course, there are going to be some coping tools here. That's my jam. (laughs) So uh, of course, that's important. But there are also a lot of resources on my website that I just want to mention that can help you with the actual coping of these things. So, you know, between my blog, my membership, working with me one-on-one, all the good things. What I wanted this quick conversation to be about was why we grieve the way that we do, why it's so emotional, why we can feel stuck and why it can feel irrational at times and why it hits us in such intense ways when we don't ask for it and we're not expecting it. So now I know you might be saying, Tara, I know why I'm emotional and I know why I'm sad. I lost someone or I lost something. You know, tell me something I don't know. <laughs> I know why I'm emotional. Why wouldn't I be? To which I say, absolutely makes sense. But hear me out on this episode because we're not just validating your feelings here. Of course, we're going to do that. But we're digging deeper about why exactly grief hurts so bad. And I feel like, you know, I see this in the grief space. I see this on Instagram and like, I, I kind of see this, but I think it's important to kind of dig into this more and elaborate on why it, it burns and it aches in places that we like didn't know that we had within us and why that is sometimes hard to understand. And that might seem obvious, you know, you might be like, well, I had such a bond with this person or they, you know, they were the light of my life. But I want to also get into why it's so difficult to navigate this grief and these profound losses on a day-to-day basis, almost more from like a scientific level. So hang out with me on this one, because when we can better understand the why behind all of this, we can better understand the emotions we're feeling and why they're coming up so strong and be able to recognize them and see them and feel them and then let them pass. And it's when we begin to understand this that we can start feeling unstuck, a little more patient with our grief, and even hopeful that this process will evolve and shift with time and with the right grief work and that, you know, there is joy out there again, whether or not we believe that (laughs) at the current moment. So I wanted to start this conversation with a really beautiful quote from the movie Good Grief on Netflix. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend it. Because it's not only really relatable and very well written, but there's also so much truth to it in terms of what is happening in our brain as grief kind of overcomes us. So Daniel Levy's character in this movie says, I've been reading that the brain is like a muscle. That's why getting over a death is so hard. Because your brain has been trained to feel things for a person, and when they go away, your head is still operating under the impression that it should feel those things for that person, like muscle memory. So I'm just trying to train my brain to not feel as much for right now, just to get me through the next year, so that I'm not constantly reminded of the fact that I am now both an orphan and a widower. Let that sink in for a second. That was intense. (laughs) Um, But that really hit home for me, especially with the, the orphan part, not having my parents, but... 
double whammy what this guy was going through in this film. So I wanted to make a quick point here, though, before going further with this. He mentions here not wanting to feel things, <laughs> right? The whole premise of this episode is we do want to feel things. So we don't want to not feel things. I understand why people do this. I do. I understand why we want to numb. And I understand how that can feel necessary at times, right? To keep our head above water. But of course, we want to avoid, quote, just getting through a certain amount of time. Because you want to live a life where there is joy and there's fulfillment and meaning and depth, right? You, do you want to live a life where you're just getting by? I don't think so, right? Whether it's the next year that's alluded to in this quote, or even just a day at a time, if that's what you're struggling with right now, I know how painful these reminders can be, and I know how painful the day-to-day -day can be. I know it's exhausting, and I know sometimes we just need a break. And that's amazing, and I and I encourage that. We can take breaks from our grief. I know it doesn't feel that way, but we can relieve ourselves of our grief, but not through numbing. We do this through affecting coping tools. So high level examples here. You know, this could be through professional help and talking it out versus bottling it up and, you know, trying to figure it out on our own and ultimately not understanding that. So that's ultimately not effective, right? This could be through journaling. If talking it out with someone feels uncomfortable right now, taking a walk and, you know, feeling our feels that way, listening to a meditation or simply closing our eyes and, you know, taking in the birds outside or whatever sounds that we hear, just being really, really present with it and embracing those emotions and, and really feeling those at our core. And that is painful. That's very, very painful. But the whole premise of this episode, and we're going to continue getting into this, is to embrace these emotions as they come. So I want to share another quote <laughs> that came to me while I was on a walk one day, actually speaking of walks, and that for me is very cathartic. It's very therapeutic. It has been very much so in my grief journey. I don't know about you, but it is from where the tears flow, the growth goes. From where the tears flow, the growth goes. I feel like there's so much truth to this. And am I saying you need to sit in a corner and cry all day every day? No, but I've worked with clients and I've, I've certainly met people along the way where they really avoided crying. They avoided that expansiveness of letting it out, physically letting it out. It is amazing. And you know this, if you had a good crying session and you've you know, gotten to the other side of it and you're like, whoo, it's such a release. And it might not necessarily make us feel less sad, but bottling that up within us can have really dire effects on our physical and mental health. The more often we allow ourselves to not only get in touch with our emotions, but to allow them to flow from us freely, it frees our soul. It absolutely frees our soul, even just a little bit, small moments at a time, one by one, we release bits of the pain that plagues us from our loss. So embrace every tear, celebrate every meltdown, feel the pain as deeply as you possibly can. Yes, even if it hurts, give yourself permission to feel the rock bottom. Why? Because you can only go up from there. But I want to address this emotion of anguish that we feel, especially in the first sort of period of grief. This is really prominent in the acute grief, I think. And I'm full of quotes today, so <laughs> bear with me. But this was just so, it really helps prove my point and really inspired me today. So next I want to quote uh, Renata Suzuki. She is a poet and a quote writer. And this quote about anguish really, really touched me. She said, anguish, it's one of those words you understand the meaning of just by the way it sounds. It has this gnarling rasp to it as you twist your mouth around it to say it, kind of like what feeling it does to your insides. It's an awful, drawn out, 
knotted up word. It's also one of the things I feel without you. Let's just pause and let that sink in for a moment. Have you been there before? Have you experienced this depth of anguish? I think this is arguably one of the most painful and difficult emotions to get through. I don't even want to say get through, just to experience simply because of the rawness of it. How you just want to cry or scream or curl up in a ball and just lose your sanity right there on the floor. I have been there, I assure you. The biggest initial hurdle I've found in the grieving process is having to be willing to engage fully in our life during bereavement. And when we are in this state of anguish, this is so hard, you guys. If you have been there, if you are there now, I see you on this one. When we lose a loved one, it's common to know that the person is gone, physically gone, and simultaneously harbor this magical belief that they will walk back in through the door again. Like, we we know that's not true, but it takes a while to get used to this. But given that's not true, given that won't actually happen, it's this relearning of our reality that we have to engage in. We cannot ignore that. And that's where I see so many people get stuck because they don't want to engage in that. They don't want to entertain that thought or entertain that idea of a life without their loved one. So they don't engage. And this is grief. This is what makes it so difficult. And this is why the brain can struggle. This is why, you know, one of the things that can make the day-to-day existence with grief, with this loss, so profoundly hard and exhausting. And it's funny because I, I had this realization one day later on in my grief. I was like, the same brain that's in the depth of grief is also the same brain that has to get us out of it. So how can we show up for ourselves better and really allow these emotions to be understood and experienced so we can engage in the bereavement process properly. How do we do that? Let's break emotions down here a little bit so we can really understand the root of this. So in the words of Dr. Jill Bolt Taylor, she's the author of My Stroke of Insight, a brain scientist's personal journey. This is where the sciencey part kind of gets fun for me. <laughs> she says, when a person has a reaction to something in the environment, there's a 90 second chemical process that happens in the body. After that, any remaining emotional response is just the person choosing to stay in that emotional loop. When I first heard that, it was a bit of a whoa moment for me. I had heard somewhere way back in the day that we experience emotions for about 90 seconds. So that was not new to me. But this idea that after that we're, we're choosing to experience that still, we are actively choosing to stay in that state. I had to take a minute to wrap my head around that. Especially as we grieve, that's a very humbling thing, I think, because these emotions we feel can seem to last so much longer than that. But if you think about it, you know, maybe we're going through emotions where we're experiencing anguish and then longing and then anger. So it kind of makes sense that there is this ebb and flow of emotion, right? But to even think that it eventually becomes a choice for us to stay there, in a way, it does make sense. But at the same time, when it feels so out of our control, we might be like, well, okay, so what do we do about this? How can I get myself out of it? So if the psychological lifespan of an emotion in the body, in the brain is 90 seconds, this might beg the question, are feelings different from emotions? Let's ponder that. So what, what, you know, what are feelings and what's the kind of the difference here? Feelings are our interpretation of emotions coupled with our thoughts in the present and memories of the past. It is the meaning we give to our emotions. Once we integrate that emotion with our thoughts, judgments, beliefs, and past experiences, etc., we begin to feel 
those emotions. Feelings tend to last longer. So our feelings are our intended choices through our thoughts, conscious or subconscious, based on the refractory period of our emotions. So now you might be like, okay, Terry, you're losing me. What is a refractory period? (laughs) So a refractory period is how long we allow our emotional reactions to last. A refractory period is how long we allow our emotional reactions to last. It is the duration we continue to feel our emotions, and this can be days or weeks or months or years. Now, here's the super important piece I want you to keep in mind here. So if you're distracted a little bit, or if all of the sciencey stuff is boring you or losing you a little, come back to me because this is exactly how people get stuck. This is exactly how people become doom and gloom in their grief. <laughs> I did some research around this, and this is also some information that came out of my education as a grief coach. And once I understood all of this or began to, it really changed the game for me and how I understood my emotions and my grief. If this refractory period is in hours or days, our emotional reaction becomes our mood. If the same lasts for weeks or months, it becomes our temperament. If the same lasts for years, it becomes our personality trait. You might have heard the word rumination, this endless loop of thoughts that keep those feelings, those that correspond to the emotional reactions of these past experiences, alive in the body. And with rumination, we can often feel like we are just in this state of suffering, But this suffering often doesn't feel optional because we're usually not able to identify the thoughts that are causing it, especially through the despair and pain of grief. Like we might be like, well, my loved one is dead. That's what's causing it, right? I understand that feeling, but hang, hang with me. We can get trapped in a vicious cycle of those same emotions influencing our thoughts and the same thoughts cycling back to the same emotions again. When we're used to feeling negative emotions like sadness, anger, anxiety, shame, whatever this is, our brain strengthens these pathways. Our brains are made up of neural pathways, which are developed through experiences and learnings and time. So when we regularly feel these emotions, when we regularly allow ourselves to get stuck and ruminate on these negative emotions, those neural pathways get stronger. It becomes easier and easier to trigger those emotions and the stories that we've associated with them. So what exactly do I mean by this? For me, one way I interpreted this is let's say we're really harping on the way our loved one died, the circumstances around it, perhaps a role we feel we played in it, like we should have done something different, that we could have prevented it, whatever it is. There can be a lot of guilt, regret, anger, resentment, deep sadness, shame around that. If we continue to ruminate on this, that only strengthens those neural pathways. And that's what strengthens living in that headspace. And that is what can really affect us long term. And here we're caught in a vicious cycle of despair that we can't get out of because we're not allowing ourselves to. So how do we change, adapt, and grow new neural pathways so we can live with our grief in a more tolerable way? The true power we have within our hands is sitting back and observing these things with logic. So what does that mean? It means that we have to develop ways to accept our emotions without judgment. Because the more we accept, we allow those emotions to flow and watch them fade away. I know what you might be thinking. How are they capable of fading away when it feels like they never will or they'll come right back? <laughs> First of all, it doesn't mean that they can't come back. They, they probably will. That's the point, right? This is all going to ebb and flow and they'll come as they want to. But it's how we hold space for them that matters. I'm going to repeat that. It's how we hold space for these emotions that matter. 
by giving these emotions the time and attention they deserve, I like to think we're actually taking the power back. I know it doesn't feel that way by letting them in and sort of take over for a minute, but let me expound on this. I recently heard, here I am with another quote, (laughs) I heard another beautiful quote and insight uh, from Tyler Perry, who was recently being interviewed by Oprah that I wanted to share with you. This really hit home for me. They were having this amazing conversation about resilience and forgiveness, two major components to the grieving and healing process. And he said, grief is a very random thing. It visits at random. You can't schedule it. I tried to work it away. I tried to drink it away. I booked myself like crazy. And all it did was wait for me to finish. So when it shows up, however it shows up, let it show up. How powerful is that? All it did was wait for me to finish. I mean, wow, (laughs) that's intense, but it's so true, isn't it? These emotions will never be pushed away, not permanently, at least. That is why they have to be seen. And by doing this on our terms, that's how we can better cope with them on a daily basis. This introspection is really critical to understand the cause of those emotions so that we become aware, learn from them, and handle them better next time they show themselves. And by the way, I really want to mention here, I think this is equally important, this also applies to emotions like joy, elation, and happiness too. All of these beautiful positive thoughts. We can also reflect on these when they come up and pay attention to what is making us feel more full and uplifted and perhaps find ways to add more of that into our lives. How can we do this? One is through meditation. I talk about meditation a lot. I believe in it. I believe in breath work. And, you know, this is where we can really calm down the brain waves and take a step back, be really present and involve our analytical mind, which separates the conscious mind and the subconscious mind a little bit. We can also do this through practicing mindfulness or breath work, which is just being aware of the physiological sensations you are experiencing, as well as the thoughts and the stories that your mind is creating around those sensations. And the other thing that I'll just say quickly about mindfulness is that it helps us to become more aware of how our emotions express themselves in our bodies without letting our mind attach itself. It's about helping us step back and create that space around our experience. Then, even if those physiological feelings don't immediately change, our attachment to and interpretation of those feelings do change. Let me repeat that again. Our attachment to and interpretation of those feelings change. That, in my eyes, is a real game changer because it allows us to see and validate these emotions as they come in. We're so much more aware of them now and how they're actually helping us try and cope. They're coming up for a reason. It is not just to make our life a living hell. I know it feels that way, but they're actually helping our brain make sense of the loss that we've experienced. But in giving them the attention they deserve and not bottling them up or pushing them away until later, we're less likely to feel this stuckness and strengthen those neural pathways that we don't necessarily want to get stronger. And we're not going to feel this crazy attachment to them as we once did where it brings us down. And that, in my eyes, is the essence of coexisting with our grief. Now, the irony is that this you know, 90 second rule, so to speak, that we talked about earlier, these 90 seconds of feeling an emotion has also been used to shame people who can't seem to get over an emotion in a short time span. And I just think that's so unfair. So I just wanted to like mention this here. You know, some people might say that if you're really practicing mindfulness or whatever, then you should be able to release the story and release that emotion and just focus on the sensations, you know, really quickly let them go, let the situation go and move on in serenity. No, (laughs) and that is not what I'm implying here either. 
for us grievers especially, that's easier said than done. Serenity, this idea of serenity, that can feel like a long way away. That doesn't even register on the radar, right? It is such a delicate balance, you guys. It is such a crazy push-pull that we're dealing with here. And we want these emotions around just long enough to be witnessed and expressed and experienced, but not long enough for us to get stuck in that rumination space. That's why this whole interconnected series of skills, learning to observe thoughts and separating facts from interpretations is so critical, not just for interpersonal relationships and how we, you know, treat people and move about our day <laughs> interacting with others, but simply for our own inner peace and, and coping with our grief. So it doesn't drive us so crazy. And I want to note here, you know, we as humans, we are story making machines and we often tend to interpret our body's signals as emotions. And there's some truth to that, but you know, in fact, it's all just part of the process. It's all just, it's happening. These emotions, they're going to go and come unless we attach a story to them and keep them alive and keep them stuck in that loop. And we often do this. We often inadvertently create this for ourselves. So I want you to remember today, in case you need to hear this from someone from a third party, we don't have to live in the darkness. We don't have to live in the darkness. We can get out of that loop. It doesn't mean the emotions won't come and go. It's pretty much guaranteed that they will. But I hope what you have taken away from this episode today is that it boils down to how we choose to cope with them and how we choose to understand them and experience them that matters. That's what matters. That power is within our hands. So I want to close out this episode with a final quote. I know I am chock full of them today. Once again, from the film Good Grief that I mentioned at the beginning because it was seriously so good. <laughs> and I am just obsessed about how loss was illustrated here. Daniel Levy's character says, Loss, it's like a little ulcer right here that never goes away. And you somehow figure out ways to take your mind off it enough to not feel it as much. But yeah, sometimes you lose sight of what's going on around you because you just want to be able to breathe the way that you did before. You just want to be able to breathe the way you did before. I mean, so beautifully worded and so poignant and painfully true, right? We can often feel so stifled and overcome by our losses, never to feel the same way again. And you know what? In some ways, we are never going to feel the same way again. We can't compare our lives, our emotions, our experiences pre-loss and post-loss. And we feel things that are inconvenient sometimes. We just do. And that's okay. Because that is the essence of grief. That is the essence of living with it. And that is what can set us apart from someone who has really not experienced loss and grief. Not in the way that we have, at least, whatever that looks like for you. We do figure out ways to take our mind off of it with some time. And in a way that is not just distracting, I mean that in a way where we are functioning with it. And with time, that acute grief, that naturally eases up. But then milestones in life come about or it kicks up new emotions or you know new aspects of our grief. That has been very true for me recently. As of this recording, at least, we just welcomed our baby girl, Audrey, last month and Life without my parents has taken on an entirely new meaning now. I have never needed them more in my life in some ways, and I'm grieving them in a new way. So I bring up this example just to say, you know, this is a testament of what grief can look like, and it's why it can't be rushed, and that is why it can be so frustrating when people do try and rush us. So I just want to validate you today. Please 
never feel rushed in your grief and never feel any shame or guilt or like you are doing something wrong or feeling something wrong if you are experiencing your grief in new ways, even years down the line. That is realistic. By putting any kind of time frame on them or by having any shame around experiencing our grief in new ways, that is not realistic because that is just simply not how grief works. So, you know, also, I just want to note here, maybe they're not even big milestones that we're experiencing and it's just those quiet daily moments that are the most painful. That happens too. No matter how this shows up for us, in order to feel like we can metaphorically and maybe even physically in some ways, breathe again one thing that remains true and this is where i'll leave you today we must experience feeling these emotions to begin healing and remember this healing journey it is continuous it is ever evolving and there's so much growth that comes along with it that i want you to look forward to and it's all about baby steps always always. And really what this also means is fully feeling our emotions while physically breathing into it so we can move this through our body so it can be experienced and released. And it is about doing this over and over and over again. This is the essence of being human, right? We experience countless emotions and countless feelings every day. Our emotions are not out to get us, but rather they can sometimes be indicators of disharmony within ourselves. So in our case, this could mean some things that we need to work through with our grief. But I also want to note here, we don't have to mentally get to the bottom of all of our feelings all the time. This can actually make us get even more stuck at times, especially if we're trying to do it by ourselves. And I've heard this example before, you know, think about it. A toddler doesn't have to explain themselves to feel better. Sometimes they just need to cry it out, feel their feels, and then release it. We are the same way, even as adults. So it's so important to feel your feelings accompanied with that breath as we do it and let it ride with you. Let it ride with you. Maybe it is a naggy backseat driver sometimes, and maybe sometimes it's a helpful co-pilot with you in the front seat. But either way, you know, remember, we don't need to define it. Like, sure, like we've talked about, we can acknowledge what it is we're feeling. So maybe it's longing, anguish, exhaustion, regret, indifference. And we, I think it's important that we understand the why behind them, right? That's the whole premise of this episode. But I just want to also clarify, we don't need to stay there too long and rack our brains about why we're feeling something. It's just a part of the process, like I said earlier. It just is. So journal on it, meditate on it if you'd like. But whenever you feel like it's overcoming you or disrupting your day-to-day life, I encourage you, feel it and release it. Feel it and release it. Allow that to be your mantra. (laughs) Breathe into it. Drop your shoulders. Thank any negative thoughts or emotions for stopping by, but feel empowered to tell them to move along. Welcome those positive, uplifting emotions. Ask them to stick around a while and give yourself and your brain, which is trying so hard, hard to catch up with your new reality of whatever your life after loss looks like, give it that time to make sense of it all. That is when we can start feeling unstuck, more patient with our grief, and even hopeful that this process will evolve and shift with that time and with that grief work. So with that all being said, I really hope this episode resonated with you in some way today. I hope it maybe unlocked some aha moments for you. It certainly did with me as I was doing my research and as I was gearing up to share this information with you. If you enjoyed this episode, let me know. Drop me a DM. Let me know what stood out to you. As always, if you feel compelled, I would love a review or a rating on whatever platform you're listening on. It really helps me get this content out to more people who could use it too. 
But in the meantime, I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day and I will catch you in the next episode. I am sending you a huge thank you for tuning into today's episode, my friend. I'm so grateful you're here and for the steps you're taking to heal your heart, open your mind, fulfill your soul, learn, grow, and evolve, and move through this crazy thing called life in big, beautiful, impactful ways. Visit lossesbecomegains.com for my blog, more coping tools, ways to work with me, and so much more. And be sure you're following along on Instagram and Facebook at Losses Become Gains Podcast. I love seeing new faces, meeting new people, hearing your stories, and supporting you however I can. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already, and share this episode or this podcast with someone who could use it too. And remember to always keep asking yourself, how will I turn my losses into gains today? I'll catch you in the next episode.